Hey everybody, it's me, Blake, aka The Pop Nook, and I am very excited because I have with me today Kat Cressida. I am super thrilled to be able to have some time face-to-face, -face, even if it's virtually, to chat with you today, Kat. Thank you so much for being with us. And um, basically, what we're here to do is explain a little bit about an event coming up at Sick Pops, which is a Funko Pop shop located in Tustin, California. I'm going to be there as well as Kat for a really, really cool signing and event so that she can sign pops or what have you for these characters that she has had the privilege of voicing as a voice actor. So uh, this is going to be on September 3rd, which is coming up very soon. By the time we post this, we're going to be right around. Okay, next, well, it is next weekend. Yeah, about a week yeah. and a half. Yeah. So I just thought I would kick us off about the event to just ask you, Kat, um, at, at these events or um, if there's particular things that you're bringing with you, like what can we expect if we attend an event like this to see you? <laughs> Fun. Uh, pops. Oh, that's not a Disney pop. Pops. You can expect pops and me and exclusive Disney merchandise. And I know, Blake, you were excited when I shared what my agenda is for doing these private store signings that I'm a big, that I'm, you know, hugely honored to be invited to all over the country. Um, it's not just to say it out loud as a voice talent, when we are lucky enough to book roles for an animated series or a video game or a Disney park role, we of course never are thinking, Ooh, maybe it'll be a Funko pop one day. That's totally out of our hands. We never know if the characters are going to be popular enough for that. So it's been a huge honor <laughs> to have so many of my main characters that I've been honored to voice over the years turn into pops. <laughs> so that I can do these awesome signings and meet all the amazing pop fans, which you've been educating yeah. me. Yeah. And what's cool is that you didn't even until recently know much about Funko Pops, right? No, not at all. I it think three years world. ago, three years ago, my social media manager was all excited because she saw that they were dropping the uh, Haunted Mansion, you know, 50th anniversary one. And she got all excited and wanted to post about it. And I was like, a funky? What are you talking about? What's You're a not the only one? <laughs> yeah, and she's like, you know, those cute little box dolls that you see everybody. It looks like a bobblehead, but it doesn't move. And yeah, like I wasn't, I didn't know. So I've I've now been very educated. But um, what I was gonna say was that the whole agenda for me in doing these, not only to meet the fans, but anything that's a profit, um, I donate pretty much the majority of it to one of two charities, which just is awesome to be able to do so that it's kind of a win-win for everybody. Yeah, yeah, and those charities, I believe, are No Kid Hungry, correct? That's and right. Jeff you also have Give Kids the World. Is that the second? Yes. Great. Awesome. The majority of it right now is going to No Kid Hungry, which for those of you who don't know, it's the cute charity that's got like a, a apple as its logo. But anyway, Jeff Bridges started this about 25 years ago, and it helps feed school children across America and their families who are um, food insecure is the term, who really struggle to have three square meals a day. So uh, it's one of my favorite charities. And of course, Give Kids the World is the one that's set up for, uh, works in tandem with the Make-A-Wish Foundation, so that when a child wishes to go to Disney World with their family, it's Give Kids the World that basically sets up everything in terms of flights, hotels, meet and greets, and ensures that they're well taken care of during their time at the parks. So. That's so awesome. Well, for those of you watching that might be wondering what the connection is, what's very cool is that events like this that we're talking about, like going to the signing at Sick Pops on September 3rd, is very cool because it's not just going to get to meet someone that you love like Kat, but also, you know, when you're participating in these signings, you're contributing to her donation and um, to those, to both of those charities is a really cool thing. So that, that's a really special thing. I've, I've told you, Kat, when it comes to these things, if you're a collector, you know that there's tons of ways that you can go to signings and all that. And typically there's not this like extra element of, of charitable donation and such. So it's really cool thing. And I, I respect it a lot. And, and it's Thank awesome. you. So to be the opposite of arrogant, do you think people know the characters I've been honored to voice for Disney? Was that introduced? That's a perfect. That's a perfect segue because I actually the first, <laughs> the first, the first question. Or like, who is this? <laughs> yeah, the first question that I did want to ask you because uh, I posted a question sticker on my Instagram story a couple days ago 
Um, somebody uh, mentioned that they do know of a character that you voice, but they want to know who else. So maybe a good question would be, what are some of the favorite characters that you have gotten to voice and bring to life? Yeah, so um, I'm, of course, honored to be the Haunted Mansion Bride, which to Disney fans seems to trump all. Um, you know, I I've done other Disney characters, but that one uh, is pretty special. And of course, Haunted Mansion has a very loyal following. <laughs> so yeah. I'm Constance Hatchaway. I'm also the face reference for her, for her, you know, for the figure, for the full uh, audio animatronic. Yeah. Um, and... I'm also the voice of the little girl lost in the Tower of Terror. For those of you lucky enough to still enjoy that since they ripped it out of our park out here on the West Coast. But um, so I'm the, the voice of the little girl that you hear haunting throughout the entire queue line. And once you're in the ride, it's awesome to be that. And I'm the voice for Jessie the Cowgirl, the official voice for her for everything Disney parks, Disney shows, Disney rides, Disney attractions, Disney parades, Disney toys, and Disney video games. So awesome. And occasionally for shorts and, and things like that. Um, of and course. for, for Jessie, you call that voice matching, right? Is that yeah. that's what the term is? And it's different from an impersonation. I'll just say this out loud for those who aren't as familiar with the entertainment world. Um, an impersonation is what Robin Williams excelled at, where it was done for comedic, uh, you know, to to get a laugh. So it's exaggerated. It's not supposed to trick you audially into believing that that's Jack Nicholson or the 30 million other characters that he <laughs> impersonates as the genie or, you know, from all his stand-up routines. It's, it's supposed to literally trick the ear a voice match so they're used of course for ADR for movies when the celebrity is not um, available to dub in changed lines or lines that were damaged uh, during filming for example I've voice matched Sigourney Weaver for pretty much every movie she's made since uh Gal what was it called Galaxies not Galaxy's Edge Galaxy Quest oh yeah yeah, yeah. Oh, that's, um, cool. that's a new thing that I didn't know you did yeah um, and then I got to be Sigourney Weaver for the animated series Solar Opposites, which oh. is created by the same people who did Rick and Morty. So every time it's Sigourney Weaver, that's me voicing her. Oh, how cool. Um, and and that's really, that's what it's for. So every Disney character, um, of course, has an original voice, the person who created it. And these days, that's more often than not a celebrity, an on-camera, you know, A-list celebrity. And then they always get a voice match uh, to be available whenever the talent is not available. I think a lot of people are probably under the impression that when they're at Disneyland waiting in line or whatever it is, that it's really the person. And a lot of the time, I, I would venture to say, based on what you've told me, that it's probably not often that person. It's, it's a mixture. I mean, it really depends on, you know, which, which celebrity is and how busy they were at any particular time. And we're not really supposed to ever say you know, I've been honored over the years to get to do it whenever Jen Cusack has not been available. And um, she's got such an amazing on-camera career. She just yeah. does so much that it's it's always an honor to step in for her. And then non-Disney, non in case there's pop collectors out there who tolerate the Disney but are not as addicted as we are, <laughs> um, I'm uh, Dee Dee from Dexter's Laboratory and a bunch of video game characters and leads at Marvel Electra uh, for video games and other things that come up for Electra occasionally. So yeah. Do you as a voice actor prefer creating your own voice for a character or do you like voice matching better? I think it depends on the day. <laughs> That's fair. I just did a voice match for a very, actually this is kind of fun to be able to say this and, and tease at it. I don't know if I'm allowed to say it out loud yet. Because the character, oh yes, the character has released, so I can say it. So um, for if there's any Star Trek fans out there, mm -hmm. I'm deeply honored to be the voice match for a character called Ilya, or Ilya, depending on which way you want to argue that it's pronounced. Uh, I think it's Ilya. But she was the one in the very first Star Trek movie, the gorgeous Eastern Indian woman who, and this goes, this is like, a, I think it's a 1980s, early 80s movie. The first um, Star Trek, the motion picture. But for Star Trek fans, it's a very big deal. It's like the Princess Leia. Yeah, totally. I was thrilled to do a voice match because I could kind of step back and not um, 
then you're just focused on the match and being true to the match and what and the guidepost somebody else already created and not necessarily have to go crazy with your own. But then there's days that I don't want to do the match because it's all scientifically based and I'm worried about my mouth and my voice and my throat and I just am happy to set free and do a crazy character. Absolutely. Okay, so um, let's see. We probably have a lot of Disney fans watching. I know I myself am a very big fan of Haunted Mansion, both as an attraction and as a storytelling aspect of a Disneyland park experience. I just love everything about it. I know that you do share a lot of really amazing facts and fun things on your Twitter. Um, So if any of you are interested in those behind the scenes looks at Disney parks, um, Haunted Mansion fun facts, that's a really great place to go dive down a rabbit hole. What is something that you can tell us about Constance that we might not know? Maybe just like the average person riding Haunted Mansion. Well, if it's a Disney fan, they probably know a lot of it. I guess if you're a non-Disney fan, there's a bunch of things you wouldn't know. This is an opportunity to show at these uh, at these pop signings and fan conventions. By the way, I don't know if you know this, but they just announced that I'm going to FanX Salt Lake City. So awesome. That's so, so exciting. Amazing. I'm That's so honored. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, it's a very, very big honor. So um, at these signings, these were created by an amazing Imagineer, uh, Scott James, and I signed them. And then there's also these for the Tower of Terror. Hollywood Tower of Terror. That is awesome. They're they're so cool in real life. Like they're stunning. Haunted Mansion literally has been a, it was one of the very first things that Walt wanted when he put in, uh, when he started to imagine a park. And most fans don't realize this or know this or care about this part of the history that the back history of Disneyland. Um, There are a lot of passionate fans who love the archives and love Imagineering. And that's my big focus is what the Imagineers did on my Twitter and my IG stories every day. On IG stories too, every day. I post a little bit of that amazing amazing lost footage that most people haven't seen. Um, But he conceived of the park originally in the 1930s after Mickey Mouse was a hit, a big hit, a movie star. And he had, for the first time, he was in the black and he had money. And Walt had always been fascinated with world's fairs, world fairs across the country and across the world. And back in the day, before we had internet, before we had, you know, movies, color movies, before we had sound movies, before we had Disney cartoons or Disney parks, if you can let your imagination go there, the world obviously was very different. And amusement parks were very, they weren't an American thing. There were a few amusement parks in Europe. In America, all we had was carnivals, um, literally little pop-up carnivals with the same kind of rides, the merry-go-round, you know, a couple of dark rides that were like, I think it was called the Tunnel of Love or something like that. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, these were not what you would call sophisticated attractions and uh, a Ferris wheel, you know, that carnivals were pretty much it and they usually accompanied uh circuses and they would just pop up here and there so um back in the 30s walt started to fantasize about a world fair kind of a theme park where he could have the quality of attractions that appeared at world's fairs and world's fairs back in the day were the big deal in terms if you were if you loved rides technology high tech rides you would travel great distances once every or once every four years. Uh, the only thing at the time that really existed that was like that was Tivoli Gardens, which yeah. actually just had its anniversary. So um, he stole a lot of ideas from all of the fairs that he went to. There was a railroad fair in Chicago that I sometimes show that footage. And when you watch it, you're like, here, I thought Walt came up with all this. Nope, he stole it from the Chicago Railroad Fair. I actually saw, um, I was watching this this show on Netflix with my roommate, um, Somebody Feed Phil, and it is basically just a docu-series where you follow um, this man who is the producer of Everybody Loves Raymond, and he's in, um, I think it was Copenhagen, and uh, they're at, I don't know if that was the theme park you just referenced, yeah. but um, they were at the, they were at the park, and they mentioned in the in the show like oh yeah walt you know came here and he really liked what he saw and you're looking around like 
that looks like the Matterhorn. Exactly. Yeah, it's crazy. So that, that's a very fun fact. Yeah. As long as Walt had an idea of a park, he always wanted a haunted mansion because in his idea of um, what this park would be, it would represent all of the things that he loved as a kid and he loved haunted houses. And Disneyland did not celebrate Halloween effectively until the late 80s, um, which is interesting. So long story short, haunted mansions were basically what it was for people who loved scary spooky haunted one time was going to be called the museum of the weird Mm. walk through a haunted exhibit and it evolved and evolved and evolved and they built the mansion they literally put the building up um as early as the late 50s early 60s and it then it just stood empty for like eight years because they couldn't figure out how to create an attraction that would justify walt's imagination and 70% of the illusions in it still to this day are classical magician tricks from as early as the dark ages, projection and Pepper's ghost. I hope I'm not boring anybody out there, but this, that's so awesome created from, and then he kind of Americanized it. You know, he, he pulled from different horror movies that were already kind of in the zeitgeist Frankenstein, um, Dracula, you know, he pulled elements but there had never been a haunted house, um, what's the right, template prior to what Wald created. It's hard for us to know that because most of us were not around in the 30s and the 40s to know that nothing like this ever existed. Yeah. Um, and so, and he was like, we'll do a seance, even though that's not technically part of a haunted house, but he made it. So now when we think of a house, we do think of a seance because he popularized that idea. Somehow, by the time the mansion opened, after 20 years of it, of Walt having this idea of a doomed bride uh, who dies of a broken heart, by the time they built the mansion, they forgot to complete that storyline. So it just kind of got lost. And for years, as I know, you know, any, any Disney fan who's probably older than 35 might remember, there used to be a bride stuck at the back of the attic and the attic was such an empty non showroom if anybody remembers that there was like hardly anything going on in it <laughs> it's just like kind of an empty space that you rode through waiting to hit the graveyard from the ballroom okay i see yeah and at the back of it there was like a, a bride that changed how she looked every maybe nine to ten years but she didn't do anything she was sort of like a, a mannequin that just was at the back and it wasn't until they did the re- refresh of the attic and said, hey, we've got this room and all this great technology. Maybe we should do something with it. Yeah. Um, so that's the, the the area we ride through where we see the different um, like paintings that, that change, correct? And then like right before the hat box goes. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. All right. So we are going to just continue going along. I have one more, uh, more like broad Disney related question for you. Go for it. um, I just would love to have you explain a little bit more about just your, your family, your Disney heritage, if you want to call it that, your legacy as a someone who loves Disney, but also is very close to the parks. Um, If you want to just share about that for us. Sure. Um, So I'm very honored that I grew up learning about the parks from the inside out because my father, when I was little, worked with Imagineering. Um, He wasn't an Imagineer. He worked for um, a media outlet, uh, KHJ, which for anybody who's a nostalgia fan or loved Once Upon a Time in Hollywood will know that's the radio station Brad Pitt was playing constantly in his car while he's driving around LA throughout the entire movie. KHJ, ABC Network, and Disneyland all throughout the 70s. So when I was very little and a tot, I was accompanying him to meetings both at Imagineering in Glendale, as well as uh, down at the park. When it was a very informal, laid back, you know, now Imagineering's kind of become this, you know, as well it deserves to be, you know, sort of vaulted, amazing, magical, um, hidden legacy. But back there, back then it was, It wasn't a culture of fame the way it is now. And so I learned how the Tiki birds worked way before any three-year-old would ever want to know how they really worked (laughs) because it takes away some of the illusion. But for me, it was cool. I loved knowing that the voices brought the characters to life. 
that it was geniuses behind the scenes that made the magic happen. I loved it and I thrived on it. I got into college early and I cheated and lied and became a cast member half a year before I was legally supposed to. Oh my goodness. <laughs> but I was so eager to become a cast member. Shh. <laughs> I won't um, tell. I was so tell. eager to be Hey, if Robert Downey Jr. can be a Disney legend, even though he got arrested for smoking Maui on uh, <laughs> on the Sky Buckets, I can say <laughs> that I was a cast member a happier early. And um, that's kind of how I got started with the Disney thing. And then um, did other things in entertainment before I went into voiceover. So no, I did not always know that I would go into it. And sadly, my father was not around to know that I became a part of this iconic classic attraction. But uh, at least he helped inspire and develop the DNA in me for it. Hopefully. Yeah, it sounds like it was always a part of you, which is so awesome. I know, I mean, I love that you touched on, you know, the difference between what Imagineering was then versus now, because I know that like myself, as someone who's not very learned in that whole realm, it's it feels very mystical. Like it, it feels like, oh, we don't know much about that. It's like this big thing that it's like it it's shrouded and like this mystery of like oh you'll it's like untouchable so it, it's interesting to hear like kind of the opposite about its beginnings well then you would love i mean literally every morning i do this collaboration with different imagineers or you know some of it from with the archive uh, footage or the museum walt disney family museum um footage showing you the behind the scenes of how something was built time lapses that would blow your mind of sleeping beauty castle behind the scenes of how the jungle cruise is put together then building the animatronics for pirates behind the scenes it's so cool and, and this is what you do on twitter right yes every morning every morning at around what would be 4 a.m our time 7 a.m you know for everybody on the east coast Okay, so I guess to kind of bring it all back to the uh, reason that that probably a lot of people are are tuning in to to for at least you know for me um, is the pop. So we talked a little bit at the beginning of this about how you're very new to the pop world. Um, we have talked personally in our conversations about you know <laughs> you don't. You don't um, you don't necessarily sit there and say that's a Funko Pop of me, but it's a Funko Pop of the character that I get to, you know, bring to life. And 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 I, having the experience of having these figures of yourself, I have a few. Um, this is the uh, original Jesse Funko Pop. So this that's is amazing. The, this is the one that was. Um, this is the first version of her that actually came out. It's uh, Funko Pop number nineteen in the Disney collection. And that basically means that this was the 19th ever Funko Pop that wow. the original Funko created in the Disney category. And then I, of course, do have the bride. And for those of you watching, Kat showed her pops in the box and mine are out. So <laughs> uh, I always have mine out of the box. I do keep the boxes, though. I'll definitely be bringing both this and my other version of Constance for you to sign at the event. But um, what's cool about this one is that this kind of features the the version of Constance that we see in in the it's beginning stretching. of the queue when you're or not the beginning but in the queue when you're in the stretching room. Yeah, um, there are also DD Funko Pops. I do not have a DD Funko Pop, but um, you're gonna sign those as well if people choose to bring that character. Do you know? Are there other? Are those the three characters that have pops, or are there others? Yeah, uh, Electra. The <laughs> video game that that's available. Yeah, something? I mean, people people have me sign those all the time just oh, because I'm awesome. sort of like the the current voice of her for games and I, I guess other things. I don't really, right. sometimes we don't know what we're voicing when we're hired. We sign NDAs and we don't really know. Yeah. Is, I think mostly for video games. For okay, Marvel. so Electra is an option as well. Do you have a favorite Funko Pop figure when it comes to characters that yeah. have Funko Pops, like that, that you've voiced? Oh, that I voiced. Um, well, well, we definitely. could do both. You could tell us your favorite also. <laughs> I, mean, this, I this one is special. I think this is special. I think somehow they do manage to make this one distinctive. To me, it stands out more than the average Funko Pop. She just seems like, at least she looks like her. <laughs> it's adorable. There's not a lot of Pops that have more detailing on the eyes than just either being the solid black circle or black with a little t uh, tip of eyelash or whatever the illusion and I love that the Constance pop actually has eyelids on it um it's a pretty cool little feature and actually for Dexter from Dexter's laboratory they actually did his eyeglasses perfectly like 
his eyeglass he looks exactly like he does in the uh cartoon yeah it's so really cool how they do that and and the world of Funko Pops actually has changed so much that now they're they're actually in some cases abandoning that like old school very square head style and yeah. the pops that we see coming from Pixar animated films um are a world different than what we see you know based on what is you know considered standard so pretty cool but you were you were gonna say you had a favorite before I specified oh yeah <laughs> well Jack Sparrow I mean I oh, saw that Funko sure. Pop and I lost my ish I thought it was so cute that's that's a really good one I love Jack Sparrow too uh but just on the you know continuing the the topic of Pops we are here ultimately to help you know raise some more awareness for not only the event that you're going to be at and basically, you know, hosting because we get to come and, and see you and learn more about what you do and and meet you and have you sign pops or what have you. And you'll have some items there um, that are exclusive to just events. All of 8 by 10s all of 8 by 10s of all the animation okay. characters that I've been Amazing. honored. Amazing. So, and, and like we said at the beginning of this video, um, you're also donating and supporting great causes with the charities that you support when you do these events. So, you know, those of you watching, when you come, it's even more special than just, you know, showing up and getting a pop sign. So, that, so you can attach these like really, you know, important and special moments to, to these figures, not only just being able to have someone that is so close into the character. Um, but it's on September 3rd, just as a reminder, it's at Sick Pops, which is in Tustin, California. And um, 15 minutes from Disneyland. Time. Yeah, super close to, to Disneyland. And uh, you can make a whole day out of it if you're driving in uh, or, you know, take a while to shop around as well, because Sick Pops is an amazing store as oh. well. Place. I and mean, I'm doing a, haunted, a history of the Haunted Mansion panel. Like yeah, a okay. real deep good history of like all kinds of trivia and hidden facts and Ooh. so yeah we're doing that we're kicking it off actually with the panel just to kind of help great get everybody settled and and there that's awesome so make sure you uh not only follow cat but also sick pops on social media so you can keep up with the event details i'll post the details wherever i'm posting this video and you can find it on my page or cat's page or sick pops and uh like she said there'll be a little panel at the beginning all about haunted mansion we talked a lot about some cool stuff with that here so if you watch this video and then come to the event you can flex some of your knowledge for us and, <laughs> and show us that you were following along but i'm really excited uh i it's been so fun getting to know you and um, I just am excited for more, more people to be able to see you face to face and I uh, just think it's a really great thing that you're doing as well on top of it all. Thank you so much and thank you for the opportunity to meet some of your pop pals. Yeah, I hope to I hope to see some of them out there. We we have a lot of fun when we do stuff out in LA and there's a lot of a lot of pop collectors in this in this big city and uh just in the surrounding areas and lots of fans of Disney, lots of fans of pops and a couple of times we talked about in this video, like, oh, are these just Disney people? We got all kinds. Um, there's, you know, people that are probably interested in Dee Dee who are watching this, people who are interested in Jesse, the bride, whatever it may be. So I think we'll probably have a great mix, a great variety of people that are, uh, you know, there for different reasons and interested. And I just, like I said, I just think it's so cool too that we get to contribute to, you know, your your donations and such as well. Thank you. All right, everybody. So we hope to see you on September 3rd. Again, September 3rd, Sick Pops, Tustin, California. We're going to have Kat Cressida there, amazing voice actor and a wonderful human being. And uh, we can't wait to see you. Bye. Bye.